all of you. <clears throat> I must thank the organizers of Manthan for having invited me to Hyderabad. I've been coming here off and on for cases and a few lectures here and there. I must particularly thank Justice Nagarajan who has come here. I learned the basics of income tax appearing before him. I must thank my friend Ravi for the kind words of introduction. Now, as the founder trustee of the Parkiwala Foundation, we organize about two, around two memorial lectures every year at Chennai. And frankly, I must say that we don't even have half as good a response as I see today. I don't say this to flatter you, I really, really am impressed that you could take the trouble of spending a holiday, an entire day to listen to speakers, and some of them on law as well, is really a tribute to all of you. <laughs> when Mr. Vikram asked me that uh, what would I speak on, he wanted me to speak something on the taxation system and so on, and he asked me to give a topic, and I suggested the topic toxic taxes and lethal laws. When I was just going through my notes and getting ready for this talk, I went down the corridors of time and went back to 1999-2000. I remember that it was a year of anxiety and expectation. Anxiety because at that time everybody was worried about Y2K, if you all remember at that time, what will happen, all the computers will crash and all the train tickets, plane tickets all will be completely in a mess. That was the anxiety. And in terms of expectation, it was the almost the semi-height of the software boom and every article you read in the press said that the 21st century belongs to India and China. And I remember reading articles saying that every civilization has faded away and it's only a matter of time before the United States, Japan also fade away. And their places will be taken by India and China, the Indian elephant and the Chinese dragon as they put it metaphorically. Now 13 years down the line, what has happened? I've stopped reading the newspaper in the morning, really. <laughs> because it puts you in a tremendous state of depression. <laughs> I'm not, I'm really serious about it. I just saw a lecture by Sister Shivani of Brahma Kumaris and she said, don't start the day reading the newspaper. And I read it at about 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, just before dinner, quickly glanced through it. By which time, most news is not worth reading, so you can save time on newspaper reading as well. Now, what has happened to this dream? I'm not an economist, I'm not, in the civil service, I don't have any national perspectives. But as a lawyer with almost three decades of practice, if you ask me, and I have had the opportunity of being a lawyer doing a lot of tax work, I've had the opportunity of interacting with a lot of corporate clients, Indian corporates, foreign corporates. And if you ask me, the single most important reason for the India growth story to come crashing down is our toxic and lethal tax system. There is no two ways about it. I have spoken to people, I have spoken to senior managing directors of foreign companies and they told me that look, we can handle corruption, we can handle infrastructure, but we simply can't handle this tax system that you've got. Today, it's 2013. I don't know what's going to happen five years down the line. So what do I do? Now, what are the reasons? And I have sat back and tried to think for myself, what are the reasons why we are in this state? And then I want to conclude by suggesting some my own views so that we share. After all, the name of the topic is Manthan. It's a churning of thoughts, a churning of ideas. And it's somewhat, at the moment there is no somewhat, it's only a monologue. But at the end of the lecture, I'd like to have your questions, your feedback, and maybe we can indeed make representations. 2014 
is a promising, exciting year. We do not know who will come to power, what is going to happen. But something inside me tells me that it could be the beginning of a new dawn. At the end of the day, I am still extremely optimistic. And I can tell you that where we are today with all our problems, most of us, a large part of us, are still much better off than what we were in the 1980s and 1990s. So 2014 could be the turning point. Now let me come straight to my topic. Why, what, is the, what are the flaws in our tax system? Why is it toxic? The first reason which I think is a question of philosophy, a question of policy. Why do you have tax? If you know, tax comes from the Latin word taxere, which means to touch. And I was Mr. Ahod, all heard of Mr. Parasaran, former attorney general. His father was perhaps the greatest lawyer I've met, R.K. Shwaiga. And I briefed him when he was 93 years old. And he told me, you're a tax lawyer. What is the meaning of fiscal policy? Where do you get the word fiscal? And I was felt ashamed. I said, I don't know, sir. He said, fiscal comes from the Latin word fiscus, which means a basket of flowers. That's why fiscal policy means a policy consisting of mixed measures. And when you talk of tax, he said that the basic thing of taxere, taxere means to touch. And therefore, tax must only touch the person, not cut or wound the person. <laughs> that is the Latin origin. Now, if you see our tax system, I feel that the fundamental error is we have to understand that taxes are the byproducts of growth. Tax is the byproduct of growth. Unless you have growth, you can't have tax in the long run. People say, what is money? And I've read a most beautiful definition of money in an audio lecture by Earl Nightingale. He said, money is the harvest of productive effort. Very beautifully put. Money is the harvest of productive effort. So don't believe that money is evil, etc. No. It is the harvest of your productive effort. Similarly, tax should be the harvest of national growth. Now, just see what happens. Last year, they said that the, for 2012-13, they said the income tax collection should be, was 15% more than the previous year. And this year, the target is 16.5% more. So, suppose we have collected 1,000 crores last year. And this year, we are expected to collect 1,000. 16.5% one, one, uh, more than that. So 1165 crores. Now if you are going to collect 16.5 more, more percent tax, it is axiomatic that there will that much more growth which will fund that tax. And that is not happening. Therefore what happens is, because of this philosophy of having random revenue targets, you start with absurd demands being made on the SECs especially January, February, March. Absurd demands are made on the SSEs. And it is told in the parliament that, no, 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 this year we have crossed the target by 17%. But this is the mercantile system of accounting for government also. You make a demand, you have met your target. Ultimately, the tax will never come. If you take the 15th September issue of Indian Express, New Indian Express, you will find a big photograph of Chidambaram with 20 top defaulters. I don't know if you remember that. 20 top defaulters. Not him, but his photograph followed by him. <laughs> the first is Vodafone. 22,000 crores. I'll come to Vodafone a bit later. And you'll be surprised that out of 20, 20 companies, almost 9 are public sector undertakings. So you have just made absurd demands against them, and then you make them. So that's the fundamental flaw. Now, a corollary to this thing of tax, being just chasing tax targets without bothering about growth, is the absurd kind of demands you make. And I just need two or three examples and I'll move on because I've got to finish in about 20 minutes and then you have to go for lunch. I landed in Madras, I was in Delhi, and I landed by the evening flight, it was 11, 11, 10, and suddenly I get a call, which is very unusual at that time. So he said, Sir, we're speaking from XYZ Hospital. We have to meet you tomorrow morning. What happened? Sir, sales tax is going to attach all the bank accounts and everything. I said, okay, come tomorrow morning. We have to go it urgently. 
So on the phone I asked him, I said, anyway, can you just tell me what the problem is? So in case I have to read up something, I'll sit up at night and do something. He said, they are saying, hospital is works contract, sir. I couldn't believe it. He said, really, sir, every surgery is a works contract, and from 2005, they are demanding tax. <laughs> so I had come from a flight, I had no alcohol, I was completely safe. But I said, sir, if you come tomorrow morning, come, I'll come early to the chamber and meet me. This brilliant sales tax officer has come with an idea. He has to meet revenue targets. And just then what happened, the morning at 9, I get calls from two more hospitals saying, we have to meet you, sir. Demand is, in one case, 40 crores. And I'm not exaggerating. In one case, 18 crores. one case, 9.4 crores. Same point. Hos operation is works contract. Now, the logic, just see the logic. I mean, it requires a brilliant mind to do this, you see. They came up and said, you have a surgery. Now suppose I have an accident and I break my thigh. And they put a steel plate on the thigh. Now the plate remains in my body. So he says, it's a works contract because to the extent of that value of steel plate, there's a transfer of property in goods. <laughs> then I said, that's okay as far as, because what the argument was, sometimes you put a stent that stent costs 40,000 rupees. So, and that stent is permanently in your body. So the property transfers to you. So it's a sale and the stent is goods. <laughs> Therefore it's transfer of goods. Then I said, see, leave alone that. I said, there are not many hard surgeries. Because they demanded for the entire 2006 to 2011, retrospectively demanded the tax. I said, what about the other operation? Then if you see the show cause notice, he says, suppose I have a simple appendix or a hernia surgery. I take drips. That liquid is transferred to my body. <laughs> now, luckily for us, fortunately, High Court just understood the absurdity and the demand has been stayed. Now, I'll give you one more example. I just did the case two months ago in Delhi. Look at the absurd nature. Now, this is a spectacle, right? All of us know. And under the Delhi VAT Act, the spectacle are subject to 4.5% duty. And the general category is 12%. All other goods is 12%. Now, Delhi has got a very fantastic system of deciding cases. The commissioner can issue directions and circulars. So suppose there is a doubt whether this mic is electrical equipment or audio equipment. No problem. The officer writes to the commissioner, Sir, is this electrical or audio? Then if audio is 18% and electrical, the commissioner says it is 18%. It is audio equipment, finished. And it applies to everybody. So now, I'm not joking, I'll, unfortunately, just Badal Dharas gave the state and we'll challenge the section also. The demand is, you have got the specs, this is spectacles. Now what is this? Also spectacles. Believe it or not, the query raised to the commissioner is, will these dark glasses, or they call it goggles, are they spectacles or not? <laughs> 11th May the letter is written. On 18th May, commissioner says, this is not spectacle, this is other products, it will come in the last category, 12% duty. Why? Answer is, and this is in the notice, this is the, in the order. He says, when you wear specs, you are trying to Use it for better vision. Now, I've got myopia. So I'm using specs so that I can see far distance. Otherwise, I can't see most of you. But when I wear this glass, the window's got number, I'm only doing it to enhance my beauty. <laughs> and we just make it for everybody, so. Now, this is the kind of absurd situation we get. And I'll just give one last example and I'll move on. Now, this is the cake. This is the ultimate climax. <laughs> All must have heard of the direct taxes code. It's a, it is said to be simplifying the tax law. This is not the time I can demonstrate very easily how it is going to complicate the tax law beyond measure. But one provision which I'll never forget. If you get the time, go to the whole direct tax code, take clause or section 222, Suddenly they get the idea. Nobody can go abroad without a no-objection certificate. Stating what? 
that you have paid all your taxes and very interesting that if any demand is made against you, you will have sufficient assets to meet that liability. I don't know what demand you will No, so, I, so suppose you're going abroad. Now suppose my daughter is expecting a baby and my wife wants to go for the delivery. I must give a no objection certificate that she's not an arrears and she can meet all the tax liability with sufficient assets. Suppose you want to go for a business delegation, you know, see. Okay, that's understandable because once you go abroad, if you don't come back, how to catch you? Now comes the climax. By chance, suppose you catch a British Airways flight and go to London and without NOC, then what is the consequence for his deadly crime? The consequence according to 222 subsection 5 is British Airways will be treated as an SSC in default and this plane can be attached. On giving examples uh, which will uh, show you see but the point is at the ground level it has a devastating effect I will tell you a last example and a more because it just shows there is a very large car manufacturer near Chennai 18% 18.2% of its sales are in the Tamil Nadu state and 82% are sold in the rest of the country, all of you in commerce will know it's an interstate sale. Suppose the car is sent to Mumbai or to Delhi, it becomes an interstate sale, there is a C form, it is sent, and it is again then sold by the dealer at Delhi or Mumbai or Allahabad, wherever it is, and they pay local tax. Again, revenue target. In March, this major car manufacturer has got a notice saying that when you send the car, The freight is not being paid by you. The freight is being collected from the dealer. Therefore, all your sales are deemed to be sales in Tamil Nadu. And is demanded 700 crores from 2006. Now, you can take it from me that that car manufacturer will never invest one more manufacturer in India. Can anybody believe that all the cars are local sales? And when we ask him, he said, sir, you go to High Court and get the order. Again, go to High Court and get the order. So this is the kind of consequence. Now let me go to the more uh, the, the other deadly parts of our tax laws. One major hurdle which clients are facing is the overlapping of taxes, levying of tax for the same amount again and again. If you take our constitution, so I'm not I don't want to get very technical, but all of us know that there are certain taxes which the central government can levy, and there are certain taxes which the State government can levy. Typically, VAT is levied by the state, income tax, customs is levied by the central government. Now, the Supreme Court, the High Courts have repeatedly say, said that there can be no overlapping of tax. If an amount is taxed by the center, on the same amount you can't levy tax by the state. But the problem which we are facing now, and nobody is doing anything to address it, is multiple taxes on the same item. I'll just give an example of DTH because these are all practical problems which nobody is addressing. There is not a single step being taken for anybody to deal with these problems. Take DTH service. You know, you go to Tata Sky, you go to Dishnet. All of us have got this platinum package, gold package, so you want 100 channels, 200 channels, 300 channels. You pay 499, 599 depending on the package. Now that 499, comes under the heading of broadcasting service. So you pay service tax on broadcasting service. Now, all these governments are saying, it's also entertainment tax. It's entertainment, you go to sit and watch TV, you can entertain. So I leave entertainment tax on the same amount. Luckily, the Madras High Court struck it down, it's pending in the Supreme Court. Many states have also followed the same thing. The entire batch is coming in November for the So on the same amount, you're paying entertainment tax, you're paying service tax. Now, just as an aside, the UP government has got a very good idea. For Tata Sky, the uploading is done in Noida, which is in UP. So, one letter has come saying that since the, all the channels are uplink from Noida to the satellite, the entertainment starts in Noida, in the state of UP. So, on annual revenue, you pay tax in UP. So, this is how the overlapping of taxes takes place. And, the 
other major industry which is being affected badly by this is the software industry. Is the software industry where when you make software, they are goods, you manufacture it, you pay Excel duty. Modification privileged software is deemed to be a service, therefore you pay service tax. Luckily there is a notification saying you either pay Excel duty or service tax. Now the state governments have said you also pay VAT on that. So prices go through the roof and you only encourage the grey market. Luckily temporarily the Karnataka High Court has held it back, other courts have held it valid, again pending in the Supreme Court. For the life of me, why can't we say a simple thing? If a particular article has suffered VAT, it will not suffer service tax. If it has suffered service tax, it will not suffer VAT. There can be a simple clarification. And why should every time we keep going to the Supreme Court for these problems? So the third thing I mentioned was the overlapping of taxes. Other problem which I found consistently, I mean I'm not talking of this UPA government or India government. One chronic problem which I think we all face in India is they think that every problem has a legal solution. There is hunger, food security bill. There is not sufficient education, right to education act. We argued right to education act and lost. But if you see the right to education act, it is startling. From 6 to 14 you educate the child. What happens to him after 14? You can't punish the child, you can't fail the child, you can't do this. And if that child comes, how does he cope with the other schools? Anyway, what I'm saying is, you can't solve this problem by simply making laws. Income tax act has worked not working to direct tax code. And I spoke in Hyderabad a few months ago on what is my horror for 2014 is your GST. Perhaps I'm one of the few people who's consistently at fora and platform saying GST is the worst idea that can happen to India. And many of my friends in lawyers and chartered accounts, they totally disagree with me. But believe me, GST will simply not work in India. There is no time now. <coughs> Some of the time I have written articles on that. But my point is this. Why are we having GST? To avoid the cascading effect of taxes. So, very specific. These are all very good in theory, you know, essential commodities act. You have sugar cotton order, everybody will get sugar at a very nice reasonable price. There will be heavy sugar, open sugar, the whole country will be sweet and nice. It doesn't work, it only inflicts a black market. Cement control order. The irony of cement control, it created a shortage of cement. And I was studying this and I found, rent control legislation has demonstrated to create housing shortage. And in the state of Massachusetts, when they abolished rent control, Housing shortage got eliminated. So now here I was coming to this topic. Any problem you have to make a law and try to solve it. Simple thing is GST. The fault is not in the law. The fault is in the execution. You want GST basically to collect revenue. But what is the problem in sales tax? Not sales tax or VAT, but the leakage. Only a few people pay the tax and the rest don't pay it at all. Now, unless you plug the leakage, you can have any kind of tax system, it won't work. Figuratively speaking, you can have a green bucket with two holes, and if you substitute with a larger violet bucket with four holes, or same two holes, it's going to keep on leaking, it's not going to solve the problem. And I'm asking a simple question to the audience. Under the GST, the last customer has to pay 16%, the standard rate is 12% or 16%. Can you believe most Indian customers will go and pay 16% tax, they'll say, sorry, give us the old bill. It is going to fail and if you see the constitutional GST council, all the states must be there and there must be unanimity. Is it possible? Neither of coalition government. It's completely going to fail. The fifth point I wanted to mention is a hostile tax administration. That is what is a matter of great concern. A completely hostile tax administration. Ironically, every budget they say, tax officer is your friend. You have uh, the ads on service tax with that Irfan Khan saying service tax, you get laddus and all that. <laughs> He's not paying service tax, he doesn't know what to <laughs> Now, I'll just give you simple examples. In Madras, you see, I get the impression, it's very unfortunate, but I get the impression that because they are chased by revenue targets, they've got administrative pressures. Not that the officers don't know, they know what is what is actually happening. But they are not bothered about the consequence because their job is at stake. 
Now, I'll give you a simple example. We've got a burning problem in Chennai. If you import coal, you pay X percent duty, X percent countervailing, Y percent countervailing duty. So, basic duty and countervailing duty. Now, India has got agreements with certain SAR countries and countries like Indonesia, Philippines and so on. If you get coal from that country, there is a further concession. Instead of paying X and Y, you only pay Y, you don't pay X, in simple terms. Now, all the, we have got computerization, all the records are to be done electronically, bills of entry are filed electronically. Now, what has happened is, in preparing the computer system, they have not included a second notification with user concession. So what does the department do? What will you do? <coughs> you know, very clear, give me a manual bill of entry. I'll give the duty. They say no. What do they do? They say, our system can't take it. So what is the solution? You pay the full duty and then apply for a refund. Take in Bangalore. Case after case after case we are doing in deal, particularly in Bangalore. Assessments are reopened. This is the worst, most misused abuse section is this 147 and transfer price in two sections. Assessment. Can you believe it? A large company, one of the world's largest company, has got has employed 3,500 people in Bangalore for doing research. It has got HTTP I mean these software technology park license, got all the government permissions. You can reopen assessment for six years. After five and a half years, they reopen the assessment. On one technical point, some mistake or some flaw in the return which has been filed for one year, they have reopened the assessment and sought to demand duty entirely. Every software company who has got full tax benefit under Section 10A has suffered this particular problem. Now, these people are simply horrified, and that's why you'll find in the recent past, have you got a very major expansion by any foreign company? No. Why should they do it? And now in the 2012 budget, they said they can reopen assessments for 16 years. So today what you do, up to 2029, if you are still alive, we don't know what will happen to our assessment. That is the problem. Now, in fact, I just tell a small anecdote. And I was appearing before, uh, as a junior, I was appearing before a commission of central excise. Now those of you who have got some experience with central excise will know that they issue a show cause notice. And whatever you say the demand is, confirm. He says, sorry, you go to the tribunal, go to the high court. So what EDB says that this is a horse is a buffalo, he'll confirm it, and you have to go up and argue. So I was appearing before a very nice uh, commissioner. And while the, after the hearing was over, he said, have a cup of tea. And he asked me, you're practicing in the high court also? I said, yes, sir. I was just a junior, I said, yes, I am. But I don't have much work in the high court. I have more work in the tribunal and so on. What is the difference between practicing before me and practicing in the high court? How do you find a difference? So I told him, sir, before it's a tension-free practice. He said, why? I said, no matter what, I have to confirm my demand. <laughs> You get tension if the answer can be yes or no. If the answer is one particular way, then there is no tension. <laughs> so you are not particularly amused. But this is what actually happens in the department. Now my final point as far as tax is concerned is this retrospective amendment. And the entire debate was triggered off by Vodafone as all of you know. Now you know, I was involved in the case up to the Bombay High Court. And frankly, if the amount was 10 crores or 20 crores, it would have not even crossed the tribunal level, it would have been settled, and anybody would have said, I mean, you don't need to know the law. Simple, simple point, complicated beyond, beyond reason. Suppose tomorrow you happen to own 25% shares of Telco, Tata Motors. Now you own 25% of the share capital of Telco, so the share capital is 1000 crores, and if you own 250 crores of shares, I'm asking a simple question. Can you say that you own 25% of the factory in Jamshedpur or 25% of the factory in Pune? No, you only got the shares. Suppose tomorrow you sell this 25% share capital to let's say Ford Motor Company. Now can the stamp authority in Jharkhand say that look, you have bought 25% share, therefore 25% of the factory is being sold, now pay stamp duty on that. No. For the simple reason that ownership of shares has nothing to do with ownership of the assets. That's a simple point. 
And when you see the Vodafone, if you see the structure from 1994 onwards, 23 times different licenses were acquired. And ultimately, all was in a Mauritius company. The Mauritius company was in turn owned by a company in Cayman Islands. One share. The parent company had one share. And that was sold for $11 billion. But they could have had 10 million shares. What difference does it make? One share is that's all. Now, on that basis, they did it. The Vodafone judgment came on 12 January, I think, of 2012. And a business line asked me to write a piece on the uh, judgment. So I, I simply wrote a small 200 and 300 word piece saying that this judgment has come. It is a good opportunity to project India in a very favorable light because you are conveying the message to the world that in India there is a rule of law. For our judiciary, whether you are a foreigner or an Indian, doesn't matter. Whether it is 100 crores or 10,000 crores, doesn't matter. We will strictly go by the law. And I wrote in the article, I sincerely hope that they don't amend the law retrospectively. <laughs> I wrote in an article, you see my article on 13 January, it says, I hope you don't amend retrospectively. Because when I was a junior, and all that, he will recollect, if there is a very important Supreme Court judgment which created a complication, there will be a retrospective amendment. <laughs> then High Court judgments were overruled. Then tribunal judgments are overruled. Now, coaching center, commercial coaching center, whether Great Lakes Institute of Management or some other institute is a coaching center is a question. Tribunal says no, it's not a coaching center. Immediately law is amended retrospectively from 2003. Now the students have passed, where do I collect the tax? That's your problem. So I said, knowing this trend, let them not do it retrospectively, it will convey a long, wrong message. Unfortunately for India, the biggest blunder in our fiscal history was the amendments post war of war. Believe me, there are articles in Mint, Zia Modi also gave an interview, saying that we tried to recover 10,000 crores, which we have not done so far, but we have lost more than 30 to 40,000 crores in investments. They lost money completely. Who will come to you if they don't know what is certain? And subsequently, after the budget, I wrote an article in the Indian Express of New Delhi and Bombay. And I said that, look, I'm not worried about this 10,000 crores. Vodafone first notice came, went to Bombay High Court, went to Supreme Court. Supreme Court sent it back to the authority where he appeared. Again went to the High Court, then went to Supreme Court. Now, you fight the battle up to the Supreme Court twice. After you lose, you say, no, 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 it's bad, I'm retrospective. You can't change the rules after the game is over. And what was worrying me, what hurt me the most and what hurt all of us was, are you not insulting your Supreme Court? What kind of respect do you show for the judiciary? Just imagine if Tata had, they have taken over Chorus, they have taken over Jaguar Land Rover, and there was a dispute in England and they go up to the House of Lords. And after a six-year battle, the House of Lords in favor of Tata's, British Parliament says, I'll retrospectively amend the law and make a liability tax. Will you not be horrified? So, this is the kind of extensive damage that our system does, and that was the most toxic consequence, and we have still not got over it. And what a shame, what a shame of this entire mediation conciliation process. They amended the law retrospectively, already made a mistake. Now, Vodafone has gone for arbitration. There is a, what is called, uh, a kind of arbitration between countries where, depending on certain things, they can say that you have violated the treaty obligations. If you ask me frankly, there is no way India can succeed in that arbitration because you have violated several clauses of the treaty. So what do you do? Go for a settlement. I feel ashamed. I said, if you are a government, you say, okay, I am doing it. This is my right. I will do it. Implement it. Or have the courage to say, I made a mistake. Sorry. Hereafter, we will not do it. Wrong. Have that courage to say that. What is this question of the country going and saying mediate, settle, pay something, make an offer, then cabinet will approve? It's absolutely appalling. And talking of retrospective, if we just, Pranam Mukherjee had just said there will be no retrospective amendment, it would have done wonders for our economy. And the uncertainty it creates is so shocking that when I wrote an article in the Indian Express, I just mentioned that India is the only country in the world where not only the future, but even the past is uncertain.
Now so much for criticism. <laughs> now what is the way out? See, we can't, we can keep on criticizing, I can give you any number of illustrations as to how things are going wrong, but that is not going to solve the problem. I just share my thoughts, what I feel, but I often feel that you know, we are not even scratching our potential. There is so much of potential here. And what irritated me in the last two, three years is, we bought a fridge, a refrigerator. And I bought a habit, whenever I buy something, I like to see where it is made. Right from my child, I like first go and see where it is made. So the fridge came and then, I, when I came from Delhi, I just saw the bag, made in Brazil. And I was saying, I said, look at this, if a fridge can be made in Brazil, transported to India with custom duty, how uncompetitive have you become? This is not a silicon wafer plant or some rocket, NASA rocket launcher. This is a simple refrigerator. And we've been making refrigerators with all the and all these brands for God knows how many years. And I was telling my wife, I said, look, where have you come? That Brazilian fridge broke in one and a half years. And then he bought one more refrigerator. Again, I looked at the back, made in Thailand. <laughs> Today, if you see the data, the largest import after oil is electronic items. If you just check, nothing, nothing is made in India. I bought a night lamp that day for 14 rupees, made in China. <laughs> Download a mediation center, we floated it and we got 40 lakhs from the National Literacy uh, Legal uh, uh, legal aid cell for alternate dispute resolution. We floated a tender. Believe me, in the Madras High Court, except the mediators, everything is Chinese. <laughs>
I feel why can't we role model? Why is Singapore on top? What has Singapore done? Can we duplicate that? What is happening in Denmark? Can we duplicate that? Take up these things and find out. Now, for example, take registration of a company. In the United Kingdom, you can register a company in one-hour flat. You don't need to have one lakh for private company, two lakh for public company. No, you put 10 pounds to register the company, finished. In India, if you go for registration of a company, name approval will take between 3 days to 30 days. Now, if all the names are on the computer, why can't you do it in 2 seconds? Put any word on Google, you get the answer. Can't you know the name is silver or not? So, we can do role modeling and much get much better. And I am glad that all of you applauded when I said that we can become the first five manufacturing companies. It shows that all of us believe that India has the potential. This is an elephant which can dance. This is an elephant which can be set free from the shackles of regulations, rules, corruption and so on and so forth. And I'll only conclude that I thought if somebody could tell me that what you're thinking is absurd, I can only respond with my favorite quote, only those who attempt the absurd achieve the impossible. Thank you. I would rather have 
a mix of both direct taxes and indirect taxes. So, maybe give one here. Yes, I have seen Thank you for your lecture. I just have one question. You pleaded the cause of manufacturing, you pleaded the cause of cause it's a single tax. Then why do you oppose GST, Doctor? For a simple reason, GST is not supposed to make money. It is supposed to be revenue neutral, and it's supposed to eliminate all those classification differences you were talking about: the spectacle difference, the the hospital difference. It will eliminate it one stroke. It will make India a common market. It will go towards what you said: India making a great manufacturing industry. So why do you oppose GST? Yes. Uh, if, if you give me your, I'll send you a couple of articles I've written on why GST is bad. But because in the short time, yeah, yeah. whatever, I can give Mr. Gandhi or somebody also. Yeah. Yes, you can give. Because, you see, I've been having these extensive discussions. In fact, at one session many years ago, the Barsadi show was coming, they asked me to speak on GST. I said, I will oppose GST. They didn't call me back. So, <laughs> yes. so I'll tell you what, in simple terms, GST, in my opinion, is suitable for a small country, not for a large country of 1.2 billion people with diverse states. What local tax is good for Jharkhand may not be good for Maharashtra. What's good for Tamil Nadu may not be good. That's point number one. Point number two, I'm opposed to GST because it destroys the concept of federalism. Each state must be allowed a certain amount of economy, how it's going to work, how it's going to work. You talk of simplifications. What is the simplification? Just central government GST, you have state government GST, you have interstate GST, and where is the discipline? If you go even in VAT, how much of anomalies are created in VAT? We don't have the manpower to manage VAT. And worst of all, GST will fail colossally because of the last leg of 16% tax which is going to be levied will simply not be monitored. You go to any shop, any Kirana shop or anything, you will not be able to collect the tax. And I'll give you seven eight steps I have mentioned, but GST will fail. And most of all, if you see the 115th amendment to the constitution, the bill, the, the way in which they have selected this GST council, it will simply not work. It's up for change, you know, Pardon me? The amendment is up for change. You see, but, yeah, quite possible, quite possible. But, and one more thing I've got a basic quarrel. All these laws are very nice in theory, but they don't work on the ground. You see, for example, the company's bill, other new things, they are very nice in theory, but they will simply not work in practice. For example, I'll tell you central exercise in Modvet. I was saying Modvet is unnecessary, it's only creating complications. There was a CII study when the rate of central exercise was 16% and Modvet was given. They found that the effective rate of tax is 8% across the board, 8.5% across the board. I said, why don't you abolish Modvet and make 8.5% as the basic duty, solve the problem? How much of Misuse in terms of false gate passes, false identification, litigation, court cases. So I am very skeptical. I hope I am proved wrong. But more than that, I hope that this GST is given the burial at the earliest. That's my little bit. Next question. Yes, go on. Uh, your talk has been really engaging, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Recently, are you supporting GST or not? <laughs> I'll probably, after you listening to your talk, maybe I might not. <laughs> so recently, BJP has come up with a proposal that if it comes to power, uh, it will abolish income tax altogether and impose 2% tax on every bank transaction above 2000. Uh, how far is it feasible and what are the consequences going to be? See, I, I tell you what, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's feasible at all, number one. And the other point, other objection which I had, in, in the Supreme Court in right to education or in uh, the food security, you're going to abolish income tax. So you're going to lose, say, 1 lakh crores, hypothetically. What are the total bank transactions? And you're going to leave it 2%. Are you going to make that up? It's not possible. I mean, BJP may have an idea, but I personally feel, without being cynical, this instead of disturbing the present system, you see, what I'm again opposing, you got sales tax, you got VAT, implement it properly. Why do you keep on substituting? Systems. You got income tax act from 1961. Don't have this stupid direct tax code. Have the income tax act implemented properly. Why go now to start banking transactions? It's impossible. Yes. Our next question. Yes. Yes, sir. I have got a question, and uh, this has been shared earlier as well. Why is government so much keen on indirect taxes? Say, for example, if I go to an air conditioned restaurant, 
I pay at least 23 percent extra than my bill, and with the tip along with it. I, and I see a lot of my friends who are detesting now going to a restaurant and eat. But me, detesting going to an air conditioned restaurant and eat because you are forced to pay so much of extra tax. So why is the government not able to, you know, collect more income tax than reduce the indirect tax burden? Actually, the it's not a question of indirect in, income tax or direct tax versus the direct tax. What is happening now is the need for revenue is insatiable because you've got all these schemes, Narika, food security, that and so on, subsidies, and so on. it's going to be it's a bottomless pit. So you keep on levying tax. Now, what are the articles which are left to tax? See, service tax start. Read the Raja Chaliya Committee report. He said the major services should be taxed. Major services should be taxed. Then you keep on taxing everything. You come to a beauty parlor, you come to massage, you also tax. But then in true form, you say health massage will not be taxed. Now, how do you decide? So you keep on complicating the law. You come to restaurants. They came to hospitals. They came to lawyers. So ultimately, what they did after coming to 140 categories, they simply said 12 things will not be taxed. So everything else will be taxed. So I jokingly told my junior. I said the only thing that will not be taxed is cremation. So if I die, that burial charges will not be taxed. He said, no sir, it will be taxed, but it's in the negative list. So you are saying. We take two more questions, one from this quarter. Yes, the gentleman here. Oh, it's gone in the line. No yes, sir, I am Naresh. After him, we we'll give you the mic after him. After the, sorry, your name? Naresh. Yeah. After the Supreme Court's judgment uh, cancelling the telecom licenses, hmm. there was an article saying that uh, whether the Supreme Court cancels the license or the investment uh, or the other, I mean, other telecom has put in, all these might be reimbursed because of the reason of uh, having India having a bilateral investment treaty. Uh, I mean, we almost have 84 bilateral investment treaties. Do you think it is going to be like, uh, you know, act against the Supreme Court judgment or uh, law of the land itself? No. See, as far as the Supreme Court judgment is concerned, they have simply held that the licenses have been have been set aside on the ground that they were I know I hope you know the whole facts of the case, the first come, first up. I hope there's no time. But Supreme Court set aside all those licenses. Now, once the licenses have been set aside, then under the law, if an agreement is discovered to be void, the party who has got some gain has to refund it. So in simple terms, if the government is going to set aside the license, it has an obligation to return the monies to those persons. So it is riskier than the government. Pardon? Yeah, there is a question. Yes. One second. No, but. No, no, he already has one. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, sorry, did I answer your question? Uh, that's the question. How risky is this for the government itself? See, there is no question, it's for the government. Supreme Court has given its judgment. Now the consequences has to follow. So the government has not uh, taken the decision. Supreme Court has taken. It looks like we have created an environment where the work is not encouraged and not working is encouraged. Because you see everybody who pays tax is working. Or all his tax is going for those people who are not working. So naturally nobody is not paying your tax, is it not? And that too in those schemes, government is itself says that hardly 10 or 15 percent is reaching the person for whom it is made. So, what is the incentive for a person to be honest taxpayer and pay taxes? You're absolutely right. I mean, that's what many people also keep, my clients keep asking me. Like, one gentleman came, his uh, son-in-law was in Sweden, and the taxes in Sweden are quite high. But from birth to death, everything is taken care of by the state. Even if you have a child out of wedlock, there's no problem, everything is looked after by the state. So, they don't mind paying the tax because they know that all the needs are looked after and so on. But in our case, that's not the uh, situation. And believe me, if you, I was uh, we have done some uh, work for this, uh, the construction association, Gridai. You find that in India, if you buy a flat for thousand rupees per square foot, almost 34.5 percent is only taxes. And even uh, the overall rate of tax is extremely high because you have excise duty, service tax and so on and so forth, multiple. You're right, one big question is why should I pay tax? In fact, if you ask me frankly, the biggest failure of our 60 years is plastic bottle. Nobody provides me drinking water. Why should I pay 20 rupees for this bottle all the time? And now if you take your own home, there's no power, so you have a backup generator. You have no lot of I must keep a separate watchman. So people have asked me this question. At the end of the day, I am being self-sufficient in all the sovereign functions the government has to do. Why should I pay tax? 
But I would still say that we should pay tax because the country has to run and we have to realize that glorious future which lies ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the last question, uh, the mic is That's the last question. I'm sorry, Rajkumar. Hi, uh, thank you for the great talk. My question is slightly philosophical in the sense that philosophical. Okay. Yes. So the uh, the the government thrives on taxation and regulation, and the masses unfortunately love subsidies. So isn't it kind of a hole that keeps getting deeper all the time? So absolutely right. If you get the time, uh, you go to you go to the food security bill. You can Google Ashok Gulati and read the report of the Commissioner for Agricultural Prices. The food subsidy bill is not going to be 1 lakh crores, it is going to be 6 lakhs 46,000 crores in the first 3 years. And 38.4% is going to be wasted. It's a staggering report, you are absolutely right. You know, just talking of my own experience, we have got this in Madras. All my friends in Delhi say we want to come to Madras. 1 rupee rice, free TV, free gas, you know, cheap liquor, everything is Madras is paradise, so you all want to come to Madras. <laughs> now when I build a house outside Madras, there is not a single Tamil person to work. All the labor has come from Bengal. And my contractor who doesn't know a word of Hindi has now learned Hindi because he has to speak to those people. And when I ask my clerk, you know, for Diwali do you want some money? He says, no sir, we don't need money, everything is given by the government. TV is free, gas is free, one rupee rice. So the subsidies will ultimately finish the economy unless it is Check. And God help the country, the food security bill comes. I don't know if you have seen the bill in 33 sections and two schedules. Please read the food security bill. And the most dangerous provision of the food security bill is, it is going to be administered by the same people who administer PDS. <laughs> and you have food bureaucracy. Each state will create a food commission. Then there will be one tribunal to hear grievances. Yeah. Very fast. Thank you very much, Mr. Nadar, for this wonderful